right? Um, <clears throat> but thanks for joining this uh, discussion today. This is part of the RTI Fellows Program Distinguished Lecture Series, which we set up several years ago, where we invite in very distinguished speakers to come in and share information with us about uh, important parts of science that they are involved in. And we're pleased that uh, Dr. Joseph De Simone is here with us today to talk about the future of 3D printing. Many of you may know him. He has been a faculty member at uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill for quite some time, uh, has been active in this area. Uh, he will be talking today about uh, a process developed uh, that uses light and oxygen to grow 3D objects. Uh, that has led him to take some time off from Chapel Hill and spend some time in Silicon Valley as a uh, co-founder of an organization that's developing that. So I think you'll certainly enjoy that discussion. Uh, please remember that there's a reception afterwards. And like all events at RTI, we have more food than you will need at the reception. Uh, so we ask that you stay, hobnob with your colleagues, talk with the speaker, uh, and uh, continue to deal with important questions afterwards. Now I want to introduce our host, Tony Hickey. Many of you may know Tony. Tony is a distinguished fellow at RTI. He's been instrumental in shaping this uh, speaker series as well as other activities in the fellows program. He's always willing to jump in and lend a hand to really make things happen in terms of science and communicating about science around the Institute. And uh, he's a research pharmacologist who has over 30 years of academic and research experience in fields like pulmonary biology, aerosol physics, powder dynamics, pharmacokinetics, and drug disposition, formulation design, and device development. He's currently a staff member here and a distinguished fellow, but he's also a uh, adjunct professor of biomedical engineering and emeritus professor of molecular pharmaceutics at UNC Chapel Hill. He's also the founder and president of Cirrus Pharmaceuticals. Uh, he's quite well published, holds a number of patents, has done an excellent job here. Uh, as many of you know, he's also interpersonally a lot of fun to be around. Uh, he's, a chewer, he's a hang glider or a, yeah, he like flies these really small vehicles up into the air and has not sustained any significant injuries as of late doing. Anyway, Tony, welcome and please introduce the speaker. always a difficult act to follow, so I'm going to stick to the facts. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce to you uh, Jody Simone. He's the Chancellor's Eminent Professor of Chemistry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the William R. Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Chemical Engineering at North Carolina State. Um, it, it's really hard to do justice to all of the, the work and contributions to science and engineering that, that Joe's made over the years. Uh, he has over 300 scientific articles, 150 issued patents, and 80 pending patents. Um, he is unique in that he is a member of all three uh, national academies. There, there are less than 20 people that are in that category, and so that's in a major distinction. He's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and, and Sciences, and he has numerous, numerous uh, prizes and awards that I really can't go into. I will mention one, which is the uh, Cavilla Prize in nanoscience and nanomedicine, because I know we have people in the audience who are interested in that topic. So these all cover a wide range from entrepreneurship to innovation to mentorship on both a national and international platform. Uh, and it culminates in the, uh, the uh, National Medal of Technology and Innovation that he received from President Obama this year, which is a huge, huge endorsement um, of his achievements. Um, I'm sure like you, uh, you've followed some elements of his career over the years. I've always been amazed at the new and exciting things he's done. He was co-founder of several companies, including Micell Technologies, Biosorbal Vascular Solutions, Liquidia Technologies, and now he finds himself in the position where he's the CEO and co-founder of Carbon 3D, which you're going to hear about in a moment. Um, over 20 years ago, I think I met Joe, and he was one of the first people to greet me on the UNC campus. And so it's a particular pleasure for me today to be able to welcome him to the, to the platform on, and speak to the subject of, instead of 2D printing over and over again, a continuous liquid interface production of 3D objects. So if you'd like to come up, Joe. Yeah. 
thanks, Tony. It's uh, it's it's good to be home. Uh, Wayne said I'm taking some time off. It, meant, it sounded like a spa. Uh, it doesn't feel quite like that, but it is certainly uh, energizing. So it's great to be uh, back here, and thank you, Tony, for um, including me in this uh, in this effort here. It's great to see Ivy and others uh, here. And I've got a number of former students and postdocs here. I, I'd love to see a raise of hands who for, been through my lab. And right, so <clears throat> so no heckling from that group for sure. Uh, but it's you know it's great to be in academia, and uh, you know we we end up really just talking about their work and and uh, that exercise. It's it's fun to. To be part of a team, and, and I'm part of a really amazing team uh, here at Carbon. One of my co-founders, Ed Samulski, is here. Um, so it's it's really wonderful to do science and be back here in, in North Carolina. So let me share a little bit with you about what we're doing uh, at Carbon, and I'll talk about uh, light uh, as a chisel, and I like the metaphor of light as a chisel to fabricate objects. But before I jump into that maybe just set the context. So I, I think everybody in the audience has heard about 3D printing and its utility and excitement in so many different areas. But I think what's clear is that the field it has not really emerged to be a significant uh, sector. It's only a four or five billion dollar industry. You know, the U.S. polymer industry is a 400 billion dollar industry. Uh, and I think if you read Jeffrey Moore's book of Crossing the Chasm and the Technology Adoption Curve, 3D printing is in the chasm. And when things, when technologies fall into a chasm like this, there's a significant technological shortcoming. And in 3D printing, it's really, it's all, it's a prototyping technology. It's parts that have an aesthetic, a look, but are not functional and are certainly not made in an economically viable way. And if you look at the manufacturing technologies out there for polymers in particular, think about injection molding, and then you think about 3D printing, and you look at what 3D printing has historically, traditional 3D printing, what, what it historically has done well, and what injection molding does well, and you quickly realize that, you know, they're mutually exclusive. And, uh, and this is really the shortcoming of, of 3D uh, printing. And, you know, if, if you really want to reinforce it, you can look at this video here. This is a, an SLS technology sweeping powder being centered by a laser, getting pushed into the table, and then comes out, and it's a cake of powder, and buried in there is your part. And this is, this is one of the workhorses in 3D printing today, and it's a centering technology, and it actually works reasonably, reasonably well for metals, an atomic solid where there's very little memory of the grain of the grain boundary, but for a molecular solid like a polymer, where the properties are all derived from chain entanglements, this is not a very good process. Uh, it's porous, it's layered. You don't have the robust chain entanglements for the mechanical properties that you need, and obviously a lot of post-processing, and it just doesn't look scalable as a manufacturing technology. And we uh, have introduced what we think is a, is a way to actually bridge the chasm uh, to go into manufacturing with a technology, a new approach to grow parts that harnesses light and oxygen uh, to generate real parts at game-changing speeds. And I'll just show you uh, what our technology looks like. This is the M1 machine lowering a platform into a shallow reservoir of liquid resin. This is an accelerated uh, video. And what you'll see as a platform begins to lift an object out of that reservoir, from underneath we're using patterned light in the ultraviolet, uh, and we're growing these parts. So it kind of looks like a T1000 at a Terminator 2. And, um, and you can see that, that growth of that part. And, um, <clears throat> and so we're using light and oxygen to, to pull this off. And uh, this is a, it's, it's got a very different sort of context of, of growing as opposed to 2D printing over and over again. And, and you can get the sense of how powerful a chisel that light is to craft these parts. I'd like, you to walk you, I'd like to walk you through the details of this now. And so uh, we unveiled the technology 
in science about 18 months ago, uh, also at the same moment uh, in a TED talk, um, and then our company came out of stealth. So I think that was sort of an entrepreneurial hat trick to have a paper in science, uh, TED talk, and, and coming out of stealth mode. Uh, but what we do is we have a, at the at the key of that of this technology is in that reservoir uh, has a window at the bottom of the reservoir, and the window is a very special window. It's not only transparent to light, but it's highly permeable to oxygen. And so in many ways, it's a lot like a contact lens that's transparent to light, breathes oxygen, and it's actually a multi-layer composite. We have a lot of technology embedded in the window itself to allow us to deliver oxygen, control the amount of oxygen, control the light coming through, and get everything right to, to grow these parts. Now, light and oxygen work in polar opposite ways. And, and uh, in fact, those of us that teach polymer chemistry uh, often talk about oxygen as a nuisance. It inhibits chemistry. It inhibits the photochemistry. It certainly inhibits free radical chemistry. And there's a lot written about how challenging oxygen is. And what we ended up doing was actually turn that on its head and use it to affect what we're doing. And so this image here, this is uh, optical coherence tomography. It's Think of it as ultrasound imaging with uh, light instead of sound waves. And uh, it's a cross-section of us growing apart. Right in the center is a 2 millimeter diameter part growing at 200 millimeters an hour. The speckles are nanoparticles that we added, that we doped to the resin to, to give contrast as a contrast agent. And so what you see is you see this part coming, growing right off the, off the base of the window uh, where the light is the most intense right in the center and you see the resin flowing in underneath the part, right? And flowing in underneath the part, it gets consumed into the part and then it's pulled up. And as you pull the part up, there are suction forces that bring the resin in underneath. If this were a standard window, impermeable to oxygen, we would be right where the light's the most intense, we would be gluing the part right to the window. And But instead, we have this um, uh, a sea of oxygen coming through the window as well that counteracts the photochemistry, that inhibits the chemistry, the polymerization chemistry, uh, and that allows us to create what we call a dead zone, right? And it's a thin river of resin that's able to flow in underneath the part that's on the order of about 35 microns thick. Uh, and it's, it's really tenuous, and it, we have to control that into a great degree. It's only 35 microns thick. And so when you think about the process itself, this is a, a, a plot that we like to look at. This is in a z-axis going from the window uh, up into the, into the reservoir, from the window into the reservoir. And then you think about concentrations and you have light in a fairly uh, intense field that generates radicals. Uh, and those radicals, the concentration of radicals, tails off as we go further and further into the resin. And those radicals consume oxygen. And, and this happens in all free radical polymerizations. Once the oxygen concentration gets below a certain threshold, then the polymerization takes off, and viscosity goes through the roof, and we start converting the resin to, uh, to polymer, and we get bond conversion. And so we're really controlling that gap by controlling a set of chemical reactions, light intensity, oxygen flux, and there's a whole bunch of things that we have to control in order to control the dead zone, especially in a printer that is a general purpose printer getting an arbitrary geometry every, new, every time somebody hits the print button. And so every time we change the resin, the details of the resin, the reactivity of the resin, the dose to cure, the viscosity of the resin, how far the light penetrates, the molar absorptivity, uh, how far the light goes into the resin, um, and the green strength of the part, because we're actually physically pulling the part up and there's a lot of forces on the part. And we do finite element analysis on that part as we pull resin in underneath. There are details of the machine configuration. What is the light intensity and how do we control the light intensity? How much oxygen are we letting through the window and controlling that by controlling concentrations and materials? What is the pixel size? Another parameter. The part geometry, because we have to cover different cross sections and the liquid has to flow to the center of the part. So as you change a cross section, that plays a role. Uh, if there's any cavities, because suction forces uh, can play a role. 
Uh, and if there's a hero surface and you don't want any supports on that particular surface, uh, and then there's trade-offs on speed and, and accuracy. And, and so just to re, you know, sort of reaffirm some things, this is a printer, one of our prototyping printers operating in real time. And it's a little hard to see here, but if you look carefully a little bit to the right, you'll see vapor uh, coming off the part. All right, this is smoking hot, right? Free radical polymerizations are exothermic. And you think about a situation where if you're building a part and it's exotherming as you build it, the temperature is changing depending on the cross-section and the dwell time. This is an Eiffel Tower going through and you see what's happening in the, in the temperature as a function of time. Well, if you go back to all those parameters I told you, as you change temperature, a lot of other things change, right? Reaction rates basically double every 10 degree change in temperature. Viscosity changes. All these things matter, coefficients of thermal expansion. So we have a lot to control, and all our customers have to worry about is we have a print button, right? We have a very detailed chemical physical model with about 20 people working on this. Rheology, chemistry, physics, uh, designers controlling this process. So all our customers have to do is pick the resin, which defines mechanical properties, select a design file, and we do the rest behind the scenes. And so I think of this as software controlled chemical reactions to craft parts. And this is a fusion of hardware engineering, mechanical, electrical, optical, uh, infused with software, firmware, software, uh, and molecular science all coming together in this orchestra of activity to generate these, these beautiful parts. Um, to reinforce some of the things that are different about CLIP, we call this CLIP, Continuous Liquid Interface Production, the li and, it's, and it's really having this continuous liquid interface, right? We need that river of resin in order to, to allow us to do what we do. So this is an example uh, from one of my students at UNC, and she was, uh, this is Rima's work, she was growing parts, uh, and it had a particular angle with his part, and what she was doing is she was holding uh, the image constant, uh, a slice, an increment of the image constant while the part was growing, and in every 100 microns in Z, she would change the image. Hold it constant, grow it, change the image. Every 100 microns in Z, and so something that would be normally, you know, uh, you'd expect it to be smooth, it's staircased because she was holding it at 100 microns in vertical uh, while she, or the image while it was going and then switching. But she could have switched it every 20 microns in Z, right? Or every 0.4 microns in Z. And you see what happens to the surface finish, right? This is a continuous production of this part. If this were a traditional 2D printing over and over again, and you went from 100 micron slices to one micron slice, you would slow it down by a factor of 100, right? But while we grow these parts, they're all grown at the same time, at speed that we're just image processing, which we can do very quickly. And that allows you to have these kinds of surface finishes. And if you cleave our parts, a traditional 3D printed part uh, made uh, using a classic uh, uh, light-based SLA technology, 2D uh, layer by layer, if you cleave a part, what you'll see is you'll see the layers derived from the traditional building up of a 3D part and the mechanical properties depend on the orientation of those layers, as you'd expect. There's anisotropy due to the layering of, this, of the chemistry. But when we grow parts, uh, we, don't, we can't detect these kinds of layers. Uh, and you can get isotropic parts, especially the kinds of engineering resins that we use, uh, give rise to materials that are isotropic, which is really, really important for a whole host of applications. So that's the technology. And uh, we've put it together into an amazing uh, complete offering here. Uh, this is our printer, uh, M1. And what's really interesting from as a chemist, uh, my, with my background, um, our VP of engineering, Craig Carlson, who was the VP of engineering at Tesla. And um, he, before that, he started a software company as an undergrad at Stanford. Uh, Scott Cook bought his company, which became QuickBooks at Intuit. He was at Intuit for 17 years, uh, took a year off because he could, and, um, and then wanted to go back to work. He's, he's in his mid-50s and, um, and loved cars, loved the planet, and joined a little company called Tesla Motors. 
and he brought the Roadster out and the Model S. I mean, these are the kinds of people that we've got 25 Tesla people at the company. And so this really started elevating our vision that the fact that an internet connected device could play a really instrumental role, just like a Tesla car, right? Which gets over the air software upgrades every five or six weeks. And we do the same thing. And so as we introduce new resins and other things, we're adding new features to the, to the printer. So we do these over the air software upgrades. <clears throat> we built the infrastructure to push capabilities automatically to all the printers. Uh, and it's a browser-based system. It's a true Internet of Things. It's streaming over a million data points a day back to our servers at Amazon Web Services. We don't have the design files. We have operational data uh, to allow us to have really close customer uh, service and support. Um, we, uh, we are able to use the print planner as we change different operational characteristics or as people make, as we learn different ways of printing, we can push those new capabilities to the customers directly. Uh, and we can actually learn while we print. And so the more people use the printer, we have this network effect, which is a classic thing you'd look in, look for in a startup company, that the more people use a product, the better it gets, right? And Google is a great example of that. Where do you send people in a search? You send them to where other people are going. And we have the same sort of network effect with, uh, with what we have. And so over-the-air software upgrades is a really important part uh, of our offering. Um, but at the end of the day, this is all about real parts. And as a material scientist, this is something we felt uh, that we needed to solve um, first and foremost in the 3D printing world is to give people real parts that have real properties. Uh, we needed to do it fast. We needed to have great surface finish, but we needed to have the breadth of material properties that one would want in a wide range of applications. And doing it where there's no porosity, there's no anisotropy due to the layers, uh, and to do it where you can actually have the economics to actually get into manufacturing, which is really what our focus is. And so uh, we've offered now a, a set of resins, and we're setting up basically an app store for resins, right? It's our resin store. And right now, the majority of the resins are our own design resins that have a wide range of properties that get into the kinds of applications you'd want to see in a whole host of uh, industries. And the, the challenge is, if you look at you know, classic material properties in a, in a uh, light-based technology, that the resins that are typically made in a light-based 3D printer are often brittle and almost polystyrene or glass-like. And what you really want are properties that look more like thermoplastics. Uh, materials that look like nylon or, or polycarbonate uh, or elastomers uh, or materials that look like silicones. And so we have materials that have a wide range of properties. And our approach to achieving this was that if we relied on light alone to not only set the shape but also to set the properties, we didn't think we could get to the wide range of properties that people really want. And so thinking about that process very deeply, what, uh, what the team came up with, and this you know, mostly led by a former student of mine, Jason Rowland, who's one of the founders of, of Liquidia here in the Triangle. Uh, Jason, um, we recruited Jason from one of George Whiteside's companies up in Boston and joined Carbon. <clears throat> and what we ended up doing is, is developing what we call multi-cure chemistries. So think about this uh, very simply as you go to buy a two-component epoxy glue at Home Depot, where you have two bay and two B, and you mix them and it starts to set up. Well, we basically are doing something very similar to that in a light cured format. So given that we print so fast, uh, we have and we designed the resins to have a pot life <clears throat> such that we can UV cure the systems, uh, and we set we basically are making co-networks or interpenetrating polymer networks, where we set up a network designed from the light-based process, and then we trigger a set of orthogonal chemistries that undergo chain extension and get to very high molecular weight. And so those of you that think about uh, self-curing or self-healing materials, this has got some elements of that, right? Where we'll set the shape uh, with light, and then we'll trigger another set of chemistries that chain extend and get us to the high molecular weights at one once. And so, you know, what you can do is with software and paying critical attention to all sorts of things like the negative volume of reaction or shrinkage on light versus the shrinkage during the thermal cure 
understanding the part geometry and the process itself, with software, you can cure all, almost all ills, right? And compensate for the shortcomings of chemistry in a lot of ways, right? So we can very precisely make a part from a known CAD file or STL file. We set the shape with light, and then we go through a post-processing step and we trigger the chain extension chemistries that give us the range of properties. And this allows us to generate real parts, which is really, at the end of the day, the most important thing. Um, and so this is just an example of some of the parts, and I've got some parts here, and, and we can show you uh, afterwards. Uh, these, these are some of our really exciting parts for our customers. This is a rigid polyurethane. We call it RPU. Uh, it has, so not, not too complicated on the marketing, uh, rigid polyurethane. Jonathan, you got that? RPU. Um, <clears throat> and it's being used in all sorts of applications in automotive. And it's passed a lot of UV stability studies. Uh, our customers have, you know, words from them. It, co it compares well to uh, injection molded polycarbonate ABS blends. Uh, it's gone through the thermal cycling. And so there's a whole host of applications in automotive and, and we're making drones and all sorts of complex structures with this resin. Uh, these are some parts on the Mini Cooper. Uh, we have a big partnership with BMW, uh, and we've been making parts, and these are some external simple parts, part of their drive sharing program. Uh, and uh, these parts have gone through a Bavarian winter and now a Bavarian summer. Uh, and there's a whole lineup of parts we're beginning to make that have the surface finish uh, to be an aut uh, automotive exterior and interior parts. But this resin is being used in a whole host of applications, from aerospace uh, to, uh, to automotive, uh, to in, uh, a wide range of industrial applications, including uh, server farms and whole things that hold brackets that hold printed circuit boards and a whole host of applications. This is are some cyanate ester parts. And so uh, cyanate esters, uh, most people don't know what cyanate esters are until you walk into uh, like Boeing or or SpaceX or some of the aerospace companies. These are really high performance resins. They have a glass transition temperature over 225 degrees Celsius. Uh, they have a very high modulus, a 4.5 gigapascal modulus. Uh, they're, they're, they're sterilizable. And so we're making some surgical tools that have gone through a series of uh, multiple sterilizations with a lot of different sterilization techniques. Uh, and it's really an amazing uh, material uh, that we're that a lot of our customers are, are appreciating it's that range of temperatures. We have an epoxy. We haven't released this one yet. We'll release this one in a couple of months. Uh, this is a material that's got a glass transition temperature of 175 degrees. Really important for, uh, it's a low viscosity resin, makes complex parts. Uh, electrical connector market is a $37 billion market. One market like that. All done by injection molding. Uh, you go into a plant like Delphi, and I think there's like 800 electrical connectors on a Tesla. Um, you go into these injection molding factories and you see these 100 ton and 200 ton injection molding machines, right? And this, and it, I think this, what's amazing to me is this is all going to go away. It's going to look very different. You know, where people make pellets of plastic, they heat them up to high temperature to get it to flow, 200 tons of force to inject the, inject the polymer melt into a cavity. That's a very finite cavity to get it to flow into this high viscosity polymer melt. You try to hold on to the properties you have, but there's a lot of chemorheology taking place just to get it, you know, degradation of the polymer while you make these parts. You have to cool down, and then it's got to be a design that can pop open, right? A simple design so the parts can come out. And you know, we send all these kids to design rule classes, all the rules you have to follow to make stuff, all the things you can't do. And what's going to change is when you use light, you can make really complex things that you don't have to worry about getting it out of the cavities. And, that's, and so there's whole new designs coming if you have real materials. Um, elastomers. We have superpowers in elastomers. And we can make um, resins that have high energy recovery, uh, high resiliency, uh, also resins that are high damping. And so a whole family of elastomers tuning the mechanical properties for a whole host of applications from acoustic dampening and vibration control all the way to high performance athletic footwear uh, that are highly resilient elastomers. And we are uniquely capable of making uh, elastomers. And so we have superpowers in, in elastomers. And our customers really appreciate 
uh, the properties of these resins. They have been through hundreds of thousands of cycle tests, maintaining mechanical properties over a wide range of temperatures. Uh, and our customers, again, are putting these resins through the gauntlet uh, to demonstrate their utility in a whole host of uh, applications, measuring their energy recovery or their damping characteristics. We have an amazing silicone coming. And silicone opens up a whole new classes of uh, properties, uh, especially in medical. Think about like CPAP masks and all sorts of uh, different applications and gaskets and the like that silicones are useful. And with the surface finish that we have, um, you know, our customers are able to take parts right out of the printer, do the post curing, uh, and then they're getting them metallized. And so applications where you're putting uh, copper and then a, a metal like nickel or chromium and getting hundreds of microns uh, thin of a very thin chromium uh, plated part and using a whole host of applications. It now changes the surface rough, uh, the surface performance. Uh, also, there's an aesthetic associated with that. We can make these faux finishes. I, you know, uh, I, I've got a carbon fiber dashboard uh, in, in my Tesla and I paid an arm and a leg for the look. And it's carbon fiber and it's in a dashboard. It doesn't use the mechanical properties of carbon fiber. It was an aesthetic, right? You can make that just with light. And again, light is a really amazing chisel to give these surface textures. And, you know, that's an aesthetic. Uh, but now you think about laminar flow and, and different types of applications where you're controlling airflow, being able to tune surfaces so you can tune the characteristics of airflow in, in advanced microfluidic devices and the like. So these are the kinds of things that are happening and with an internet connected device, uh, there's amazing things that we can do and learn. Um, so our customers are getting up to about 10,000 prints now. Uh, we know all the details of the printing process. Again, a million data points a day comes to our server for each printer, uh, comes back to our servers at Amazon Web Services. Uh, and if you look at the pie chart on the right, the gray is our prototyping resin, which is a, a brittle, cheap resin that most people are familiar with with 3D printing, but two-thirds of the resins are printing the engineering resins that have properties to be final parts. So our customers are now making, making the transition from prototyping to what we call functional prototyping, right? Real parts. And so now, you know, this sets us up to start thinking about applications in manufacturing where we take every new class of resin with dramatic new classes of properties, we're beginning to spin those to new formulations that are industry specific. Adding flame retardant to meet UL rating in aerospace or automotive, right? Having GMP quality resins for medical device applications. And so we're now every family launches a set of uh, resins, uh, 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 formulation specific for the industry that we're beginning to have families of resins uh, emerge. Uh, what's really interesting too is the business model uh, that we've launched into um, with an internet connected device that we're, we're uh, pushing software every five or six weeks to the printers, we've come out as a subscription model. It's hardware as a service. So we're not selling the printers. Um, it's a subscription model. Uh, it's a three year subscription. It's a $40,000 a year uh, subscription model. Uh, and this allows us to really align our company with our, the printing performance of our customers. Right, because if they're not happy with the printing, it's, it's not a transactional sale. Right, we're closely aligned with all their printing uh, performance. Uh, we sell resins, and as I mentioned to you, we're setting up an app store for resins. We have partners that we're working with. Uh, we'll announce another new one tomorrow, but we've been working with Kodak. Uh, and one of the key things for us is if you're really trying to make a bridge to manufacturing, uh, there's a couple things that are needed. You need, the reason to have an app store for resins is you need a diverse set of resins for all the range of properties that you want. But if you're actually going to go into manufacturing, you got to figure out how to get truth in pricing on the resins, right? This can't look like a traditional 2D printing company that makes all the margin on toner, right? You've got to, you really have got to drive down the cost. And it's in this business model, with, especially with us with a subscription model, allows us to work closely with our customers and their chemical suppliers to help generate a new dynamic that allows us to have truth in pricing for resins. So you can actually get the scale up that one needs uh, going forward. 
So we have a number of customers uh, out there today. Uh, we're approaching uh, 50 customers. Uh, some great universities there on the right. Uh, there's, there's three or four missing in North Carolina we need to work on. Um, but we're just beginning to come out of the gates uh, uh, with our printer. Uh, we're heavy into automotive, uh, aerospace. Silicon Valley seems to be the center of automotive research. We're powering everybody. Um, and I'm not disclosing anything because there's a lot of companies working on cars now uh, in Silicon Valley uh, that are ma making new prototypes, new ways of uh, controlling cars and, and autonomous vehicles and, and the like, and goes all the way to drones and lightweight structures uh, and, and the like. Uh, doing a lot in the, uh, micro, in the medical space, J&J is one uh, group that's been uh, announced publicly. Microsoft uh, has been uh, tweeting about their printer and and lots of other companies that we're working closely with. So it's fun to, to watch them. But as I mentioned, the business for us today has been to enter a prototyping business because that's all 3D printing is today for the most part. It's prototyping. And so we think we have a better approach. Uh, we think we have better resins and we can give people functional prototypes. And so our business model, I've got basically 70% of the company focused on go after the prototyping market. There's about 75,000 industrial machines in the United States uh, that are basically the kind of target that we would be relevant for, but now convert them from prototyping to functional prototyping. I think there was about 13,000 machines sold last year at a $97,000 price point. So I'm talking about industrial grade machines. But on the shoulders of that, we've got a fraction of the company focused on transitioning to manufacturing. Right? And we have some big partnerships in that space, and we'll announce some more tomorrow, actually, at the International Manufacturing Trade Show in Chicago, uh, which I'll be at. Uh, but we're basically laying out uh, you know, a digital factory where there's a fleet of our printers being uh, interfaced with a wide range of uh, pre- and post-processing capabilities. And so uh, as you think about the kinds of applications that are necessary and the kinds of things that we will be doing to foster a true digital factory, a flexible factory that can make, depending on the resin, a wide range of things, and it's just different CAD files. And so the kinds of things that we think about now is the whole product, uh, where we not just think about the printer, but we think about everything and the whole ecosystem, uh, including a turnkey solution, where we think about the work cell for all the different processes. We think about the software that talks to a fleet of printers. Uh, the ability of having traceable parts. Uh, so we now, every part that's printed, and it, once you go digital, every part that's printed can be barcoded or serialized, and it can be done overtly or covertly, right? There may be only a terahertz scanner can see it, right? So you can think about part authentication. Uh, you think about counterfeit protection. But you can take all the born on data for all those parts, pull that into your ERP system, right? And we have all the data. So instead of recalling, if you have a recall, if you're a car maker, instead of recalling, you know, 500,000 vehicles, it'd be a hell of a lot better to recall the 200 vehicles that were made perhaps with a lot of resin or a particular machine configuration that was out of, out of whack. And you'd have all that data. So entire new business models emerge if you can go to traceable systems like that and have that real-time data support. Uh, we're encrypting uh, our files, so we don't have access to the design files. A lot of our customers want encryption technologies for parts, uh, for their designs. Uh, it's not only the aerospace companies that want encryption technology, but it's even the you know, folks in Hollywood that want encryption technology. So it's a wide range of use cases, and we're writing software as we go and we push that to our printers and we're getting a lot of you know focus group data from our current customers to provide them more and more features as as we go forward so it's 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 a lot of fun to think about how what one does in in that kind of environment in uh in life sciences this is probably our biggest opportunity as you think about what we can do in life sciences and you think about all the different use cases uh, and functional prototyping, design freedom, mass customization. When you think about you know, people's anatomy, whether it's your teeth or your ears or, or the morphology of a tumor, 
uh, all these different things, when you think about devices that are designed bespoke to accommodate applications for local drug delivery, for example, uh, or uh, you know, uh, dentures and, and minor tooth movement, all sorts of things become really exciting. So we got a customers doing a wide range of things, uh, hearing aid applications where you can now tie to the anatomy of, an, of someone's inner ear. These are, these are structures that are only 100 microns thick. Right? How do you make stuff like that? Right? This is what this kind of digital technology enables. Uh, this is some examples of some new separation uh, columns that we're thinking a lot about in separation media for biotechnology and, and just more just chromatographic separations where you're making meshes or devices to, to scavenge things out of the blood that might be pro-inflammatory uh, agents and, and the like. So lots of different things. A lot of the uh, students are interested in, in transdermal drug delivery. So this is a some 3D printed micro needles where you have different chemistries, uh, where we change a chemistry during mid print and put the drug on the tip of micro needles uh, that are used to deliver biologics and small molecules transdermally. Just an amazing plethora of things that people are thinking about once you hand somebody a powerful tool like this. Dental is going to be a really big market. There are 3,000 dental labs in the United States. Uh, we, ha we have a much better mousetrap, you know, much faster, highly accurate uh, system, uh, and digital dentistry is just beginning to take off. Ultimately, this will be chair side, so you don't have to come to the dentist three or four times and do some preliminary fits. You can do it while you're chair side. Just think about all the different business models that start to change once you do that, and so we're doing all the CT scanning associated with uh, these structures to, to uh, make these kinds of structures. So medicine and applications are going to be extraordinary. Uh, I had the good fortune of working with an uh, interventional cardiologist at Duke Richard Stack, and we developed a biodegradable stent. And it was a sold to Guidant, now part of Abbott. We have over 150,000 people with stents in them. But these are stents that are like shoe sizes. You know, they're five, five, size five, six, seven different lengths. You don't want stents that are like shoe sizes. You want a stent designed for you, right? And so, you know, it's not too far-fetched to be thinking about, you know, unfortunately, if you're, in a, if you're in a cath lab and you need a stent and, you know, the interventional cardiologist, she's going to, you know, look at your image up on the screen and she's going to be basically designing in real time your stent to think about the, the tributaries off the blocked artery, uh, the curvature, the kinks, all that, hard material, soft material, and she could push a button and a stent could be made, could be made on, the, on the balloon catheter and delivered directly for you. So I, I, I believe that these kinds of futures are coming. I wouldn't want to drive that through the FDA right now, but, uh, uh, but I think these kinds of opportunities are coming. And, and especially when you think about an N of one and mass customization, these uh, digital will be really, really important. So as I begin to wrap up here, I think what we believe that CLIP offers is a set of solutions that have been mutually exclusive by traditional manufacturing and traditional 3D printing. And it, we're focused on creating a new industry category of, of 3D manufacturing. And we believe that you know, with this approach, we can close that chasm and get to the economic buyers, the majority uh, opportunity that's on the other side of the chasm. And when you think about this, you know, 3D printing is not new, as you know. It's been around for 20, 25 years. There's a whole list of things that people have been touting about 3D printing that have not materialized. You think about, uh, and some of those I talked about, on-demand inventory. You know, in a slow-growth economy like we are today, uh, there's an amazing number of companies that have a massive amount of inventory that sits on the books. And how do you, you know, one of the, great ways to create value today is to free up capital, get that inventory off the books. And a lot of it's polymer, plastic-based inventory, and, and plastics age, right? They densify, they embrittle, they hydrolyze, they fade. You actually want fresh parts. So the idea of having a, a digital warehouse or a warehouse in the cloud that can you know, pull down a design and make it, and there's a whole bunch of companies that have lost their design files Right, and their legacy. Think about elevator companies and all these major industrials. Uh, we've got police departments that have great radios, but the damn brackets in their cars are broken, right? and they don't want to get a whole new radio system. Right, you just need all these parts to keep infrastructure going. Um, uh, Jeff Immelt was talking about 
the fact that you know, his production at GE is really focused now on local for local production. Right? The GE factories in the United States are going to be producing for the U.S. market and exports are going to go down because of all the barriers to entry that all these different countries are having. It's not a level playing ground anymore. And so having a digital factory in region or in country that can make a lot of different things will be really important. Uh, traceability, think about post-market surveillance and medical devices. All these things that people talk about have been held up because you don't have real parts and they're not made economically. So we think we're the trigger that allow us to actually enable these entire new business models. Uh, and we have the software team uh, and the vision to really try to capitalize and make this a reality that's been held back by not having real parts. And so it's very exciting. Uh, and so it's really enabled by, you know, think about light as a chisel. Uh, and then you also sort of take a step back and you think about where else has light impacted society or technology? And, you know, the workhorse has got that you have to think about is microelectronics, right? Moore's law has been driven over the last 50 years using pattern light, but it's light in two dimensions, right? And we think as we start thinking about, you know, light in a third dimension, really triggering broader manufacturing markets, these are huge markets uh, that we can begin impacting if you really have a, a tool that can do this. And so our aspirations are creating this new industrial, industrial category of 3D manufacturing. Everybody's been talking about it, but it's not emerged yet. And we really are focused on doing that and do it in a global way with this digital world that allows us to connect, connect people, connect ideas separate from where you actually produce things. And it really it ties in nicely with, uh, with the vision of the company. So let me just wrap up, tell you a little bit about the company. Uh, we were founded in 2013. Uh, we're moving into a 90,000 square foot facility in Redwood City um, at the end of November. Uh, we are about 160 employees. We'll be about 200 by the end of the year. Uh, we raise an enormous amount of money uh, from some of the best investors in history, as Sequoia Capital, Silver Lake, big private equity firm, uh, Google Ventures, Yori Milner, and a whole bunch of strategics. And we actually will have a, a bit of an announcement of this tomorrow as well. Uh, it's uh, an amazing board of directors in addition to the investors. Uh, we have independent board members, Alan Mulally, who is the CEO of Ford Motor Company, a great book, uh, read about American icon, how Alan saved the Ford Motor Company. And then we have Ellen Coleman, recently retired chairman, CEO of DuPont, uh, on our board. And Ellen and Alan in particular have been a great mentors and partners for me and the team. And it's really a, an amazing uh, group. So. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, end. I'd be happy to take uh, questions, and thank you for including me in this uh, lectureship. Yes. Um, so this technology looks like you can scale to build things as big as the vehicle is built. So uh, I'm guessing the inverse square law may work against your Uh, you know, so right now, i repeat, repeat the question. Um, uh, Michael wants to make uh, large scale vehicles uh, all at once. Yeah. 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 Of course, we're going to project larger images, which will get dimmer. And that'll work against you. How are you looking to solve that yeah, problem? Yeah, so uh, as you can imagine, lots of different ways of approaching that problem, too. So let me start off by saying that uh, I think it's we looked at 40% of the plastic parts on the Volkswagen Golf fit within the build volume of M1, 40%. And uh, uh, L1, get the marketing thing here, uh, L1, 65% uh, of the parts will. Uh, so there's a huge number of opportunities as we scale, um, but you're right on. You know, the, we use a DLP projection system uh, where light is an LED base and we're operating at 385 nanometers. So as you back off the projector, you have a diminution in light intensity, your pixels get larger. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a sweet spot in there regarding what it is you want. You know, one of the best ways to address that is to tile your light engine. And so you can actually maintain your light intensity and your pixel size and scale 
without any sacrifice in light intensity or resolution. And that's actually one of the ways we, we approach that. Good question, though. And way back. So we have several online questions. Uh, two of them relate to your resins. Uh, they want to know what the viscosity range of the resins you're developing is. And is it possible to switch resins midway through the process? And is there a way to print parts with a high volume fraction of structural fiber reinforcement? Uh, three great questions. So <clears throat> viscosities are uh, actually all over the map. Uh, and the, every one of the resins uh, viscosities are actually on our website. So our website is amazingly transparent with lots of data that we've really been focused on. And so every one of the resins, you can see the different viscosity ranges. Uh, but, you know, tens of thousands of centipoise is uh, pretty common. Uh, the question about filler, uh, you know, so we're operating, you know, right now with uh, a lot of particulate uh, for pigments. Uh, not so much reinforced fillers, but we're, I've got students and the team is working on a wide range of other fillers. We don't have the kind of shear forces that one would expect uh, with an anisotropic filler to have any sort of orientation, but you can imagine there might be interesting ways with external fields to try to do some of that and uh, lots, of, lots of opportunities there. That was the second question. There was a third question. Oh, two different resins. So I showed you some microneedles where we printed halfway, we stopped, we changed our resins, and we put the tip on. But that's, uh, that's print in what I would call the classic print, uh, the classic way of, of printing these parts, right? So where we have resin uh, in the bowl, uh, and that uh, as you pull the part up, the, the resin is pulled in under the dead zone as we pull it up, right? But you can imagine if we were printing in a very different way where the resin, instead of being pulled in from the reservoir, is actually coming through the platform and coming through the part. So imagine instead of a solid cylinder, there might be a 200 micron hole in the middle of the cylinder in your CAD file, your STL file, and you're pushing resin down through the part as it's growing and you're pushing it down underneath as it's coming up. Right? That's a different way of printing uh, using what we, uh, the clip process. And uh, what's cool about that is that you can actually have lots of different resins that way too, right? You can have lots of different holes and different vias with different resins coming in and make multi-component systems. It's a much more complicated process, but it's one that I think is uh, really viable and, and worth considering. The simple one is just changing out the resin in the middle of a print as we as we build that up. There's coming right behind you. Toward, towards that and to follow on, the idea of different resins and electrically conductive resins or in electrically conductive extrusions, because that's one of the things in a lot of the experimental 2D printers that we're yeah. trying to work with. So do you have any, because then if you've got it, choosing which resin is going to solidify at a certain point, maybe you need a different wavelength of light with your resin or whatever. Yeah, you can get much more sophisticated if you think about different wavelengths and triggering different chemistries, and we're not there yet. The simple way in, in so, with one type of material would be a filler that is above a percolation threshold, uh, like graphene or, or carbon of some type, and getting into conductivity there. And so we've got those kinds of efforts underway. Thermally conductive, electrically conductive. And following that, any implications for optimal battery manufacture, electrical energy storage? So I think a lot about batteries, too. Um, and um, yeah, there may be some things. Uh, we're we're not we're more focused on structural systems right now, and I think some of the structural cell designs that one could think about would be useful. Maybe some new separators would be interesting. New arrays for electrodes. I'm at this side of the room. What's your range of colors? And also, do you have any way to to put metals into this, or can you think of any ways? So we have the entire CMYK color palette. And, um, and that's really interesting to folks. And so we are prototyping resin. Um, we had Jimmy Buffett come by and we printed these amazing uh, parrots of all these different colors. Um, so brilliant, brilliant colors uh, available. And then any of the prototyping resins, you can you do, dial in the CMYK and get what you want. Initially, when we started doing this, uh, I thought all our resins had to be colorless and clear because we needed to get light in. And, and actually, in, in reality, is, is you actually don't want the light to go that far. 
you need you need a you need a dump absorbing, otherwise you get over cure or through cure, and uh, and so it's actually worked out great to have really intense colors uh, in the visible. Um, and metals, you know, I think there's opportunities for metal particles, uh, but you know the post uh, metallation has been a been a direction that people have been going. I showed those parts with chromium and nickel. Yes. So uh, I'm loving. It. Yeah, they need a microphone. People online, you're not that loud. So anytime something totally new happens, uh, sometimes you get serendipitous, serendipitous effects. So for example, when uh, nanomaterials first happened, we got bulk, we got properties which are vastly different from the original bulk properties of that same material. Are you seeing anything interesting? In the, I, I'm see, you're seeing isotropy, that's nice. But are you seeing anything that is sort of uniquely related to the way you're doing things? You know, so the, the, the more, I, I think the more uh, obvious things for me um, is that, you know, we've been listening to the mechanical engineering community for decades about the value of a unit lattice. And uh, nobody can make it or they make an aesthetically looking one, but they don't really have the, you know, so having, you know, lattices that all of a sudden you can actually look at the mechanical properties and do it with elastomers uh, or rigid materials. And, you know, now that we can also start attenuating light, we didn't think about all this in the beginning, uh, but as you attenuate light, the ability of changing mechanical properties dynamically and so what I like to think about is in, that I didn't anticipate, I had some fun conversations with Ellen Coleman on this, our board member, is that the traditional polymer industry, you know, has been taking small molecules, oligomerizing it to high polymer and making pellets. Humor me on that. And, and then you sell pellets and then somebody else makes parts and you try to hold on to those properties. But the parts, the properties are basically set. To dynamically change the properties, while you craft the part, it's not so obvious that uh, what you can do with that. And I think it's going to drive, you know, new innovations where, especially in lattices, where you can tune properties in while you dynamically create something. So we're doing the chemistry while we're crafting the part. And I think there's a richness there that uh, I, don't think, I don't think we fully appreciate yet. That would be the place that I would focus on. And would that perhaps apply more to your distributed situation, like your dentist situation, where is it the distributed manufacturing aspect is very interesting here because you produce unique parts where they're needed, when they're needed. Yeah, so you think about an oil rig, or you think about uh, supply chain in the military, or you think about supply chains on ships, and you know, just it cha everything changes distributed, and that, that will be really useful. Yeah. You. Yeah. A question: um, Are there other uh, similar emerging technologies or competitors um, that kind of keep you up at night? No in competition. Terms of speed There's no competition. No. <laughs> so you know what's interesting? That TED talk triggered um, an amazing set of innovations that were, you know, Kickstarter, all sorts of really creative things uh, that are happening. Uh, you know, this industry has been one that has had some big publicly traded companies uh, in the space. There are some new entrants like HP and others that we're, you know, uh, excited to see move into this space. I think we're pretty differentiated. Uh, we're, you know, this focus on light and real parts and fast has been where, where we focus on. Uh, the biggest innovation and what people do with this tool. We just had these kids recently uh, put this, post these videos on these skate, making skateboard parts, and they were going to make new wheels and new trucks and try to break the parts. And they, you know, it was fun to watch. It was like nerve wracking, and uh, nobody got hurt, and they and they were very successful. So that's the innovation of what people do with a printer that we're most excited about. Yeah, we need a microphone here. You got one teed up over here. Okay. Why don't you go ahead? I'm a 3D printing service provider at one of those unrepresented universities, and I was just curious, um, what are people doing uh, ex in those universities that have the printers so far, and what are your ambitions for education, and how can we get 
uh, students and researchers taking advantage of these new opportunities, exploring those new business models? Yeah, so <clears throat> you know that's probably what we want to do most of is is get this tool into the hands of a wide range of folks. Um, so they're they're mostly in multi-user facilities, uh, shared facilities. There, there are some in individual laboratories, um, and it's it's a mix. And so it's it's just like any multi-user facility that with electron micro microscopes or whatever. So or fabrication tools. So we're really interested in that. Yeah. Was there another? We want to we want to massively scale it up, as you can imagine, and. You know, schools um, are, are, you know, what's really cool about this field, this topic of 3D printing, it lends itself to capture the imagination of youngsters, right? As you think about science and math and engineering and design, uh, even, you know, the humanities and the performance, I mean, I think there's so many places where this can go and, uh, and getting them in, in these schools. But, you know, what you hear with a traditional 3D printer, a lot of schools are frustrated that it, that they don't have access to it is slow, uh, or it clogs, and it's not you know customer friendly. And you know we're not uh, we're right now focused on a, a robust technology, an industrial printer, um, and we're we're working on some of these multi-user facilities at universities. You know I suspect it won't be long before we're in some community college programs and some high school programs, uh, and it's just going to take some time. Yeah, over here. Actually, represent a community college program, and uh, it is a little expensive for us right now. But uh, I want to ask: uh, you talked about uh, the sustainability aspect and clearing off inventory from shelves and making parts on demand. If you have the ability to label parts like in really small detail, you know what benefit do you think that your products can have if you really break into large-scale manufacturing for product life cycle, knowing how to recycle and upcycle parts? Like what kind of research are you all doing about the you know, toxicity of your parts going into the environment, like planned functional life, cy like yeah. life cycles? Yeah, yeah, hugely important topics. We're right now <clears throat> strongly exploring and, and probably will be introducing some bio-based feedstocks uh, for some of these resins, which we're very excited about. Um, you know, also beginning to think about uh, some resins that can be uh, recycled either as particulate or maybe redissolved and reprocessed. Uh, for more thermoplastic. A lot of these are thermosets. And so you can think about grinding those up as being fillers and thinking about that whole life cycle associated with that. Um, <clears throat> having systems that are biodegradable is uh, probably going to start first in the biomedical side. Um, but these are topics that are really, really important to, to cover. And, you know, one of the things with a subscription model uh, is that you can mandate standards. And you can mandate uh, uh, standard operating procedures for processing uh, or recycling uh, or ventilation and things that, you know, we're, you know, this is going in mostly into industrial settings or scientific settings. And there's a standard that we're really interested in. And that doesn't always happen in 3D printing. As you know, as you see that, you know, schools getting all these printers with uh, liquid resins or whatever. Uh, that are out there, and you know, I think it's important. Uh, you know, a lot of acrylics are sensitizing resins that are used in nail polish places and floor polish, and you need to have respect for uh, the chemistry. And that's why I'm, I'm also really satisfied and happy about the subscription models because we can maintain those kinds of standards. Yeah. Or did, you're trying to get the recycling of your parts to not go into a landfill somewhere, would you see that more as like y'all labeling the parts yourself? Or would there be another kind of, you know, system in place where like the recycling facility could uh, do some kind of test and see, oh, this was produced X years ago on some printer and now we know what to do with it. It's oh, more a specific question, but just something to think about. Yeah, that's way cool to think about. Um, <clears throat> we haven't gone that far to think about it, but that's, that's really cool to think about. But I think we're way, we're, we're, we're well far from that though right now. Just obviously we're going to have 50 printers out and, and uh, you know, those times, I'd be, I can't wait to focus on those problems at that scale. It, but it's a neat way to think about it. Yeah. Yes. One of the outcomes of your TED talk was um, that uh, we are also a fab lab that is not represented on the right of one of the major universities. And we got to work on this. But one of the areas of research that the carbon 3D 
M1 actually kicked off for us is the ability to create. Who's us? Where are you at? North Carolina Central University. Cool. We're now looking at the ability to take your technology and then through the process of either electricity or electromagnetism, embed carbon nanotubes within the structure and then start building the circuitry within the structure instead of having separate circuitry cool. uh, outside of that. And the thing is, what is the area of carbon nanotubes? Are you guys even looking at it to work with it or any other um, field of science outside of light and oxygen? Uh, terrific question. We've done we very, very little in a space. I mean, I think it's a wide open uh, thing to do. Uh, to think about how one can use external fields, electrical or magnetic, or other types of fields. I'd love to get one of these printers in a, in a neutron beam and do some neutron reflectivity experiments. And there's so many things that we could do to probe that. We just did a partnership with uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs in, in modeling. There's a lot happening there. And so we, I'd love to help encourage and think about what it is you're doing. We put some carbon nanotubes in there, and you know, but it's not been very sophisticated yet. Our, our hands are full, trying to get this product out into the marketplace into creative hands. Yes. Um, so once you're done printing an object, how is it removed from the platform? Yeah, like right how? now it's we have these things called humans. <laughs> <laughs> And a uh, human, uh, actually, you, the human uses their foot, and the door opens automatically just by waving your foot. And it could be left footed or right footed, both feet work. <laughs> the door opens, and you can pull the platform out. Uh, and then uh, there is, in this current configuration, there's a rinsing step because there's some adsorption or resin, especially with the config, depending on with the part, there's some wicking, you know, rinse off the resin. If it's a prototyping resin, there'll be a, a, you know, less than a two-minute UV post-cure. Um, if it's one of the engineering resins, uh, it would go into a thermal process depending on, and it has to be carefully supported uh, because there's maybe some unsupported areas that might go from a liquid to a glass, through a glass transition that you got to be careful. So there's a lot of happening in the post-processing uh, that we're going through a learning curve on ourselves. And it's even more complicated with a general purpose printer, right? We have an arbitrary design and you want it to work well for printing one. What's a lot simpler, and it's a very different use case, is you're now going to make 10,000 parts. And you can set up all, you can set your, your methods up and your printing processes up to focus on speed and throughput and economics. Resin delivery that's automated, because right now we have humans pouring resin into that bowl. And, uh, but we have a product roadmap that's going to really focus on how to scale up and get to, uh, and some of our customers are still using humans and making 10,000 parts. Uh, but we, we think there's an easier way and we'll be supporting them in developing the products and processes and software to make that easier and easier. Thank you. Can you print moving parts or interlocking parts? We do. We have some amazing things that you, you know, uh, that are interlocking. But other people do that in 3D printing historically, right? You can make all these locks, you know, these concentric, you know, co, you know, like Olympics circles, and you can do all sorts of things like that. But there's some really cool air ducts in cars with moving parts that normally are assembled with just breaking a tab and, and then it moves. And so there's a lot of really cool things being done that way. Yeah. Where's the other microphone? So just, just start planning the microphones and we'll, yeah. Your um, technology has some really interesting applications for tissue engineering. Um, is it? Have you already tried incorporating a um, biocompatible polymeric um, system that can be photo cross-linked, like polyethylene glycol, so that it can contain some cells or some other biologically active molecules? And is there any way to decrease that temperature? Um, from the exothermic reaction so that it wouldn't harm living cells or living molecules? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Bioprinting, which is depositing out of a extrusion nozzle, nozzle, looks to me to be a, a, a more effective way to do a lot of tissue engineering. And we're not doing that, as, as I showed you. Uh, but doing scaffolds, 
uh, is uh, very relevant. One has to not only think about temperature, but UV stability, especially DNA cross-linking and other things at this wavelength. And uh, so, you know, my students, since I'm in a group, uh, are looking at, uh, in fact, we published in a science paper, we did some hydrogels uh, that are very directly relevant that can be post-absorbed with biologics and, and we're doing chemotherapeutics to absorbed into these things and some um, uh, steroids and hormones that are being absorbed or adsorbed uh, into post-processed or, or post-making the part. So a lot of different ways that making things are relevant for biology and medicine. Yeah. Many things are made in injection molded plastic, which you might be able to displace because they can't be made in metal. So does a um, improvement in the cost effectiveness of uh, laser sintering pose a risk to your ability to move into replacing plastic injection? Uh, you're talking about uh, laser sintering of metal? Yes. yes. So if there's any area that needs a breakthrough innovation, I think it's laser printing of metal. Um, it's, it's, I, I, you know, you just saw GE buy a couple of companies last week in this space. Uh, it's an area that's, that needs a breakthrough. Uh, it's very complicated. Um, it's not, uh, made the impact that, uh, that I think people want and are there, but there's a lot of hope and expectations, but the, I think it needs some innovation. Um, I don't, I'm not worried that successes there are going to impact what we're doing. Uh, but I think it'll be, it'll, I think all boats will rise with developments there too. You know, when you do a polymer out of a liquid and you have full density and you have, you don't have the porosity, uh, even SLS uh, plastic parts, you drop them into a dye, a solid part with, you know, within 30 seconds that dye permeates the entire part, right? It's porous. And uh, we have full density parts that have the surface characteristics of injection molding and the isotropic nature that one would expect, and so, you know, I think there's, I think there's lots of opportunities for both technologies, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have you had any resistance on the part of subscribers to sharing the data back to the co your company? And if not, do you see that becoming a problem? And how do you expect to manage that? Yeah, so we have uh, operational data. So right now, at the stage of our company, we have come to rely on, we we came out of the gates relying on the fact mm -hmm. that we could be hardware feature complete and be behind on software, right? So that we could be adding features over time and continuously improve the printer and its capability, especially with new resins coming on board. And what we didn't want our customers to have was an obsolete piece of hardware. Right, so we, we designed it with this sort of upgradability over the air software upgrades. So with that comes operational data, uh, it comes some metadata, but we don't have the files. And so um, we suspect down the road, especially in some manufacturing settings, we'll, that you know, machines will come off the internet and we'll be in a lockdown manufacturing mode and we'll, we'll offer that when we're ready. Uh, but right now, it's a, it's a requirement because we're on this innovation curve. We need to be able to push the, the, the advances that are happening every five or six weeks now. But, you know, we've had a lot of aerospace customers that said, no way. Uh, and uh, we said, okay, well, you can wait. And they said, okay, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this seems to be a really big step forward. What's the next big step you have to take to really compete with normal manufacturing? What is the next big step? When you've taken a step to functional prototyping, what's the next thing you have to accomplish to actually go to manufacturing? Yeah, it's throughput economics. You know, it's, it's getting, you know, right now, <clears throat> focus on, on the whole thing, to have the whole product, I would say, from resin delivery to, you know, secure internet connectivities, to um, plumbing a factory in from a rail car with resin on the outside of the building, an oxygen system delivering to a fleet of printers. I mean, it's, it's that whole product. And until you have the entire solution, you don't have a solution. And so, I, so we really are thinking about that, putting all that whole product together to enable somebody. Is that? 
the cost, is, well, there's costs everywhere, right? So resins are a big majority of it. The printer cost actually goes away pretty quickly uh, as you amortize your parts over uh, as you build. And so we have some big plans. We've got some that we'll be making some announcements in the spring uh, of products that will be getting into the tens of thousands of, of parts next year, uh, all the way to a million parts by year four, and that we're very, very excited about. And they have aspirations to go to 50 million parts a year, this, some of these products. So we're, we're moving forward in a manufacturing solution. And we can meet the unit economics for things that are uh, pretty low on the value chain. You got a mic. Um, so you mentioned that a lot of technology went into developing the window yeah. that the light shines through. Uh, is that window scalable as well? So it needed to be. So, you know, our first publication had a window that was a, a film. <clears throat> Teflon AF uh, 1600 is a amorphous fluoropolymer film, about 100 microns thick. And you can imagine there's a lot of forces on the window. And as you pull it, as, and as the parts get bigger, you know, that window as a film can drum, right? And if it's drumming, you know, 2,000 microns and your dead zone is 20 microns, that's like being on a kayak in a storm, right? So, you know, we can't control that. So we needed to come up with a scalable rigid window technology, and that's, uh, and that's what we did at the Series B funding. You know, you sort of lay out different milestones for different funding, and Series B was build a team, have resins that have great properties, and have a scalable window technology were the three things that we laid out and, and the team knocked that out of the park. And so we have we have the ability to go to large area windows. So there are a number of uh, uh, cheap systems available today. You can have one at home. Uh, any sense, uh, do you have any intention of going in that direction as well? Uh, uh, standalone home-based systems, any idea when, when we can have one at home? You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think you answered that. There are a lot of choices uh, at that scale. Um, you know, what nobody's doing is 3D manufacturing. And so as a small company with limited resources, you know, trying to do something that's really special and different is what we have aligned our company with. And so that's, you know, at some time you could see that happening down, you know, later. Uh, but right now creating this new category of 3D manufacturing is something that we think is what's necessary to cross the chasm and get into you know, large adoption of the technology. 